All right, well, good morning. This is Breakfast with the Bible. We are doing a, a, a lesson um, in, the, in the book of 1 Timothy. Alexa, stop. Uh, Christmas music. So we're doing a lesson in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And the title of this message is simply, I am the chief of sinners. And I really kind of want, I want to kind of dive into what Paul is saying here. So I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, excuse me, verses 12 to 16. And pay attention to uh, basically what he's saying and, and what I want to try to convey uh, with this message. It says, and this is Paul talking to Timothy, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and the persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorant, ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So as we navigate through this passage, I want to identify some specific things that Paul highlights here. We want to look at sentence structure, emphasis, sequence, something that Paul kind of does a lot of, which is important in reading really any portion of Scripture. We want to look at the way it's put together, who the audience was, all of these various different things, and it's important to understand. So the first thing I want to look at is what Paul says in verse 12. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me. Paul begins this statement with the intentional pointing to Christ as the source of anything he has that is worthy of mention. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me. The only reason Paul is able to do anything he's doing is because Christ has given him the strength to do it. He identifies Christ as our Lord signifying his bond with his readers. He's writing to Timothy, of course, but he's, he's writing to Timothy and then a, you know, Timothy's going to read this and then pass it on. So he's, he's reminding Timothy, really, that this Jesus, this Christ that Paul identifies with is also the same Christ that Timothy is going to identify with. And he's, he's creating this bond here by pointing it out. It's, not just my Lord Jesus, but our Lord, signifying, again, his, his bond with Timothy and any, anybody else who's going to read this. Us, of course. So he's, he's making anything he says next applicable to anybody who reads it. Anybody, of course, within the, brother, the brotherhood of believers, us, Timothy, you know, you get the idea. But the way he writes it is that what we're going to read here in this text is not simply just for Timothy. This is the way God intended it. This is why we have our Bible. So he's writing it in such a way where as we read it, as we study it, we can apply the same truths, the same principles to our life. He also avoids pride of his past by proclaiming that it is by Christ and Christ alone that he's able to do anything. Paul establishes the truth of what Jesus said in John 15, 5, that apart from him, we can do nothing. Of course, this doesn't mean we are incapable of anything, but this is this the, the, the incapability of doing anything of eternal value. That is nothing of eternal significance. We can do things, but if we want to make an impact on the kingdom of God, then it's got to be through Christ, through the enabling of the presence of the Holy Spirit. The next thing he says is also very important. It's, it's important, again, to recognize the order in which he says it. He says, for that he counted me faithful. 
You see, Paul didn't begin with this as if to stay, as if to say, I had what it takes, so Christ chose me. He doesn't start out with, he has counted me faithful, and that goes on to tell the story. <clears throat> Excuse me. He first points out that all he has comes from Christ. So anything Christ saw in him was put there by God. We recall what he says in Galatians 1.15. He says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, but when it pleased God to do this. Paul didn't have anything to offer as an unborn child, of course. When it pleased God to set Paul aside in advance for a mission, for a plan, for something that God had set up for him. God knew something about Paul that he didn't even know of himself. God knew that Paul's zeal in his previous days before the Damascus Road would be useful in his ministry. Paul was so incredibly faithful in the wrong things, he was certain to be likewise in the right things. And God understood this. Of course, God knew this in advance, but we see the truth of this, that God doesn't change Paul's personality. He doesn't, doesn't change what kind of person he is. He just redirects his focus. He takes the same passion, the same zeal he had in doing the wrong things against God's people to becoming God's person and using that same passion, that same drive. But then we look at the next thing he says, putting me into the ministry. Again, we back up. I thank Christ our Lord who hath enabled me, who has given me the ability, the power to do what I am doing here, counting me faithful by what he's deposited in me by, and putting me into the ministry. This wasn't Paul's idea. This is, there's something very important about this statement. He thanks Christ for putting him into the ministry. Now, we don't have to dig, dig very deep to understand this phrase. I tend to think that it is highly overlooked in today's society. I truly believe that the best ministers, and I use that word in general, are those who didn't wake up one day and go, I'd be a great pastor, or I'd be a great missionary, or I'd be a great you fill in the blank. I think the best of the best are those who, like Moses, tried really, really hard to tell God that he had the wrong guy. You know, okay, God, I, I hear you, but maybe you want to reconsider. Those are the ones that God wants to use, the ones who know in advance and know ahead of time, hey, I don't have much to give, if anything. But then they're willing not because they have a chip on their shoulder, not because they, hey, I've got the right stuff. Paul says, any of the right stuff that I have was given to me by God, and I cannot take credit for any of it. Those who know they have nothing of themselves to offer, I think make the best ministers. And you can use that word, you know, in, in an umbrella form not necessarily just pastors, but any, anybody who does any kind of ministry work, and that should be all of us, really. We're not doing it because we think we're good at it or we think we ought to be doing it because of who we are, but we ought to be doing it because of who God is and, and that if we look at ourselves in the light of, and I think of the Puritans and, and you know, all the Spurgeons and, and, you know, things like, guys like that, who highlight the emphasis, the emphasis, this idea that they are just unworthy of anything that God has to offer, because it, it really does. It emphasizes our, our appreciation for grace. If I don't deserve anything, if I don't have anything to give God, then everything he allows me to do is, is just that much greater. Anything he enables me to do is, is, is this amazing grace that he bestows upon us. Paul didn't decide one day he wanted to preach the, to the Gentiles. He spent his days trying to destroy Christians. So once again, Paul gives Christ the credit. Now, we would be wise to remember the sequence of that statement. How many of us, sometime or another, in our selfish pride, looked to, thought to ourselves, wow, God surely is lucky to have me around, right? Or repent, 
nah, I'm good. I, I'm, me and God are good. We're okay. May we never find ourselves in a moment where we do not consider our unworthiness before God apart from the imparted righteousness through the atoning work of Christ on the cross. May we never get to that point to say, nah, I'm all right. No, uh, Paul says, I've not apprehended. I'm not there yet. And I will never be there this side of glory. That's a, that's a promise to you. B.B. Warfield, the, the longtime professor to principal, he was, first he was a professor, then he became principal of Princeton Theological Seminary during the turn of the 19th century. He says it like this. There is nothing in us or done by us at any stage of our earthly development because of which we are acceptable to God. It is always on his blood and righteousness alone that we can rest. I can't take credit for anything good that proceeds from me that gives any glory to God because I'm not capable. The good that comes from me, the good fruit that comes from me, if any, is, is because of the work that Christ does in me and through me. Then Paul says this in verse 13, Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious? Here's Paul's description of his unworthiness to what God has called him to. Moses said he stuttered or he has problems speaking. Paul says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious. This is a pretty big, pretty big list, pretty, pretty sizable amount of stuff where Paul says, yeah, this is the reason I am not, I am not worthy. Paul's, Paul's highlighting this here. Now let's look at these three things. A blasphemer. This refers to the way we speak. This refers to the way Paul spoke. He spoke lies about Jesus. He tried to talk people away from the truth about Jesus. John Piper says this. His words tarred and feathered Jesus with false descriptions. His words mocked Jesus, essentially calling him a liar. That's blasphemy. That is speaking lies and deceit towards God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's what blasphemy looks like. But then he goes on to say he was a persecutor. This refers to his actions. Not only did he speak ill about Christ, he went beyond words. He sought out those who claimed to follow Jesus and imprisoned them. He oversaw the murder of Christians. Remember, he even stood before the stoning of Stephen. And he, he gave his approval. So he goes from blasphemer, speaking against Christ, to actually working in action against him. And then third, he calls himself injurious. Now, not only was he a slanderer and a persecutor, he was arrogant and proud. Now, we can witness fairly simply when someone is a persecutor or a blasphemer. We can see it in their actions or hear it in their words. But pride and haughtiness lies within. Sometimes people can hide that. Eh, hopefully, as a believer, you have a little bit of discernment. You can kind of read that. But it's still inside nonetheless. See, God could clearly see Paul's depth of pride. And here, Paul admits that. He came face to face with his own depravity in the presence of God. I think of Jesus' words in Acts 9. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now, who does Jesus say he was persecuting? Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? There was something to be said about that statement. Jesus didn't point out the fact that Saul was persecuting his followers, even though he was. His sin was personal. Now, his sin was directly against Christ. Now, truth be told, all of our sin is that way. But to hear the voice of God indicting you this way would most certainly have more weight than if he said, why are you persecuting my people? Christ says, why are you persecuting me? Christ makes it personal. Beyond, you're, you're persecuting my people, which is true. He's, he's, he's honing in on this one truth. 
Consider what David said in, in Psalm 51. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done evil in thy sight. Now, we know that David sinned against many in this instant, but he recognized that first and foremost, any sin you commit is a sin against God before it can be a sin against any other person. God determined the standards. But then comes hope. He says, but I obtained mercy. That's in verse 13. God granted him mercy. Paul knew that he didn't earn any goodness from God. This statement is here for our encouragement. Who was before a blasphemer? We've done it. A persecutor. Maybe we didn't put any Christians to death, but to some degree, we've spoken ill words. We've done some horrible things in our life against people who are believers and, and whatnot. And we've been proud. That's, that's the basis for all of our sin is pride. I know what I'm doing. I, I, I can handle this. But Paul gives us encouragement. He says, but I obtained mercy. Paul clearly explains that God's grace was both extensive and sufficient for him when he says in verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. In order to be able to stand and proclaim Jesus Christ, again, he says, our Lord, reminding them that what God has done for Paul is available to them as well. Moving on, he says in verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. This phrase used here and in four other places in Paul's letters are basically an equivalent to the statement Jesus makes when he says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, depending on your translation. It is a statement of great emphasis. Paul is saying the statement he is about to make is both true and significant. One would be wise to take it into deep consideration. Again, as I've said numerous times in any of my videos, redundance creates emphasis. Paul is making it clear what I'm about to tell you is of great importance. If we note the context of what Paul says immediately before this, he gives a brief outline of his personal history. So this is a testimony of sorts, right? Charles Spurgeon wrote this. If we would impress the gospel upon others, we must have first received it ourselves. Paul can attest to the fact that what he's about to say is true in a most personal sense. Paul, throughout his letters, speaks of what he knows through both his experience and the revelation given by Christ himself. Paul was selected specifically by God for bringing the gospel to the Gentiles by way of inspiration. There are few, if any, who can relate to the immense gift and responsibility that was given to Paul. But then he declares the faithful saying. Remember, he says, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that, this is in the middle of verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the gospel message in its simplest form. Christ stepped down from heaven in the form of a helpless child as we celebrate this season to show us a childlike faith in its purest form. He grew up as a young man learning and experiencing life in such a way as to give us a savior who we know is familiar with our troubles. He lived a sinless life and voluntarily gave it up on our behalf while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait for us to get it all figured out. But then he says this, excuse me, in verse, uh, still in verse 15. And this is my favorite part. He says, so he, so he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. This statement, again, is what inspired this message. I want to I break that down a little bit. So what exactly is Paul saying by that statement? 
Seems simple enough. Paul is, is calling himself the worst of sinners, right? I mean, can this be true? Can this be accurate? Is Paul indeed the worst of sinners? Well, Paul's writing this letter, Nero was emperor of Rome. Now, a piece taken from an article says this, Nero is known as one of Rome's most infamous rulers, notorious for his cruelty and debauchery. He allegedly killed his mother and two of his wives, as well as his stepbrother, only cared about his art and had very little interest in ruling the empire. Tacitus, a first century Roman historian, made this statement, covered with the skins of beasts, Christians were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Clearly, Paul was not worse than Nero, right? Okay, what about Judas? Christ was betrayed and sentenced to death because of him. In Matthew 26, 24, Jesus makes this statement, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but... Woe unto that man whom the Son of God, Son of Man, excuse me, is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Was Paul worse than Judas? Can it be true that Paul is the chief of sinners? In a way, based on Christ's words to him in Acts 9, it is quite probable that it is true. However, let's consider this. One may be able to understand Paul's statement a little bit better by reading it this way. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, or to whom you are chief. So why do I suggest that? Because this way we can begin to grasp some of Paul's perspective. You see, it's easy to look around the world and say someone else is responsible for Christ's death. I mean, we didn't put him there, did we? What would be different about our lives if we consider ourselves personally responsible for his crucifixion? What if we were to hear the voice of Jesus calling us, calling us out, why are you persecuting us? Per excuse me, persecuting him. What if his words came directly to us that way? What if we really saw our sin that way? It was my sin that nailed him to the cross. It was my hand that swung the hammer. I was the one who fashioned the crown of thorns and drove it into his flesh. I pierced his side where blood and water poured out. I did that. My sin did that. What if we looked at it that way? What would change? What would our, our perspective on this be? If we saw it that way, if we saw my sin, I'm not worried about yours. My sin is the one that hung him on the cross. What if we did see it that way? When I view Christ's death this way, then I can easily consider myself, as Paul did, the chief of sinners. So what is the applicable benefit to this perspective, you ask? This approach to my sin as opposed to the sins of others will make it that much easier to put to death the temptation to say, as the Pharisee did in Luke 18, I thank the Lord that I'm not like that guy. If I take responsibility for my sin, for the death of Jesus Christ on that cross on my behalf, if I took responsibility for that in that way, I'm not going to look at this guy over there and go, well, at least I'm not like him. Because I'm the chief of sinners. So there is no other guy in the room at the moment. So, Moving on. Instead, we should approach God the way the publican did in that same passage in Luke 18. Standing afar off, not even able to lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Think of the humility in Peter's voice in Luke 5, 8, when he falls to his knees and cries out, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He doesn't say depart from us, for we are sinful men. He says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Something about Jesus in comparison to his own heart was so much that Peter recognized his inherent weakness and wickedness. Or what about Isaiah 6, 5? 
He says, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He's taking responsibility. He's owning it. The presence of the Lord does that. Woe is me. I am broken. I am finished. There is nothing left. I am done. When you come face to face with the reality of yourself in the light of God, there is no more appropriate response than this. Paul saw his sin in this way, as should we. We have broken the law of God. James says in, in, in chapter 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. An ancient rabbi says it this way, If a man perform all the commandments, say one, he is guilty of all and each. To break one precept is to defy God who commanded the whole. They are inseparable. So is there a worse sinner? Will we ever refer to ourselves as the chief of sinners, honestly? Would we ever allow freely without contest someone else referring to us in that way? Or would we get defensive and accuse them of being judgmental? I think again of an instance in the life of John Wesley. After his conversion, he was so excited to preach about the need for a savior, he stood up in front of his old congregation and admitted to being a sinner and told them that they were also sinners. So what did they do? Did they fall on their faces in humility and repentance? No. They threw him out and told him never to come back because he told them the truth. John Newton, towards the end of his life, said this, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great savior. And Thomas Watson said this, the greatest of all disorders is to think we are whole and need no help. And finally, verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul closes this, this passage with a great hope and encouragement. He could have very well been correct when he called himself the chief of sinners. It's in scripture. It's got to be true, right? And here is the reason. Another statement from John Piper goes like this. It seems right that God would see it. See to it, excuse me, that Paul realized this and felt this about his own arrogant heart. You, Paul, are the least deserving of my mercy. So I'm going to save you so that when you write 1 Timothy, no one will ever be able to say, I am too undeserving. If Paul was indeed the chief of sinners and Christ showed him mercy, then there's hope for us. Christ's gift of salvation is available to all, all who would receive it, to all who will admit to the grave offense of living in rebellion to a holy God. In Romans 10, 13, Paul's quote, Paul quotes the prophet Joel when he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If God was willing to save the sinner of sinners, there is hope for anyone. May we see our sin in light of the truth that it is Christ whom we are persecuting and humble ourselves before God and allow him to put us where he wants us in any ministry, whatever, that he's prepared. So that concludes, I am the chief of sinners. May you have a blessed Christmas. Celebrate the gift we've been given. Recognize your unworthiness before a holy God. And may God richly bless you and keep you. And I will see you next year because I'm done for the season for, the, for this year. Um, God bless you. And uh, keep watching. Like, subscribe, do all those things you do. And uh, we will see you next time.